is you can't control the power of anyone's thoughts at the end of the day. So if I, I could be sitting here and thinking, you know, what was the four I get at the end of the day? But I'm, I'm not told you that. I'm just thinking that. That's right. The so the power of someone's thoughts, you, they might turn around to you and say, no, I love people with glasses. Well, I love, he ain't, I love people with glasses. Your glasses are great. And I'll say, turn around, actually, your glasses are rubbish. You're four-eyed. I don't like four-eyed people. Blah, blah, blah. I'm only thinking that in the back of my head. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, the problem, that's the problem. You never know what someone's thinking. Do you, know I mean? yeah. you never know what's underlying and what someone's thinking. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, and, you know, like, yes, yes, it has got better. But believe me, it's got better. I, I'm a child of, you know, the 60s. I grew up with, you know, the, the skinheads and all that kind of stuff. Well, and, and where did you, you know, grow up, Colin? Where, where was it that you were uh, born and raised initially? I was, well, I've been, I was born in Bedford. Um, right. So um, in a very very working class area of Bedford, a place called Queens Park. It was very multiracial. It was mainly mainly blacks and Asians and Italians. Um, so my my neighbours, uh, you know, there's very few English in my street. Um, so it was, it was generally Asians, black people, and Italians. So the Italians that came over for the brickworks at Bedford and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then black people as well. Um, so and we, we lived in a part of town that was heavily densely populated with the sort of mixed, um, sort of mixed minorities uh, groups, if you like. Um, and, you know, we experienced, you know, racism, you know, uh, back then in our sort of younger years um, and stuff. And, and But you could, that, back then you could sort of, you could almost, the enemy was there because they were skinheads. Do you know what I mean? So generally, yeah. you think there's a skinhead. There's a bunch of skinheads. That they don't like. They don't like blacks. Do you know what I mean? They don't like Asians. They don't like blacks. They don't like people of color. So they're easier to spot at the end of the day. And they didn't make any real um, excuses about not liking blacks and stuff. And they saw you across the street. They'd be shouting across the street and stuff. Blah blah blah. You know, you black this, you black that. Blah blah blah, and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of knew where the enemy was. You know, at that level. Um, what we didn't know was, you know, at that young age that, that then tra transferred into adult life and then it, into the corporate world um, and stuff. So, you know, it was, um, I joined the RAF when I was um, 17 um, and, you know, I, I, was, I experienced lots of racism in the RAF, don't I mean, you know, not lots of it, uh, almost on a daily basis. Um, and... Open or open or underlying? Mostly open, to be fair. Um, really? So you know, you, you might walk through an aircraft hangar, um, and somebody would call you to shout out the N word, and then you'd think, well, hang on, there's about twenty five guys in this aircraft hangar working on different aircraft, it's echoey, and you, you look around, and you don't know oh, who said that. I don't know, I don't know who said that. Do you know what I mean? And you know, you you might confront one person. That it wasn't me, mate. It wasn't me. That it wasn't me. Um, so, you know, th th it, there was a, a lot of that um, and, uh, you know, you, what I realised in, in the RAF was that I couldn't fight my way out of that problem because the, the military, um, the higher echelons of the military, they didn't care, do no. they? You know, I'd go and say, oh, well, why were you fighting the airman? Well, you called me an M word. Well, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? You, you're in the RAF, son. You know what I mean? And, you know, it wasn't like, I'm going to sort that guy out at the end of the day. I'd be on a charge. You know, I was, I'd beat somebody up that I thought used the N-word against me at the end of the day. So then I'd get charged and they'd get let off. I said, well, you know, that's not fair and that kind of stuff. But, you know, and then I just thought, wow, do you know what I mean? I'm not going to win this battle in here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I ain't going to win this at the end of the day. Um, and it came, it came in so many different guises, do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I, I was... One instant, I was I was with a friend of mine um, outside the Naffy where we used to drink and that kind of stuff, and we had a detachment of um, uh, Royal Engineers that were working on the airfield, um, and they were they were on the base, and um, I, I walked up to my mate and he was smoking a cigarette, and I took it off him and I took a couple of drags, and I went off and that kind of stuff, and didn't think anything of it, and then he came into the into the mess hall and he goes, oh, oh you know, he was like a bit put out and stuff. And I said, what's that mate? He goes, well, that Royal Engineer said to me, you're not going to smoke that after that ends, that, that ends me now, are you really? And that kind of stuff. Oh, I, mean, I was fuming, I went right out there and, you know, had a rap, don't I mean? Yeah. That kind of stuff, don't I mean? But, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you were, 
having to put up with on a daily basis, um, you know, in, in, in that kind of establishment really. But um, so, you know, so then you know, it, it sort of, it was open there. When I moved into the corporate world, I didn't experience it so much. Um, See, what, what people, any, some people watching this won't know, Colin's a very su successful guy, successful business, um, lovely house, lovely cars, and a very successful guy. And, and in my introductory video to this, I actually used the uh, analogy that surely you can't have gone out, made a good living, worked hard, saved the money to buy nice cars. You must have been a footballer. And when I yeah. sent you the link, you watched it and actually, yeah. what was it you messaged me back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, funnily enough, you know, I've I've experienced that, you know, um, 12, more than 12 times in the last 12 months. Um, I even, I had a guy, I had a guy yesterday, uh, I was walking my dog and um, he was walking his dog and he stopped me and he goes, we were chatting, he said, oh, do you live in the house in the end? I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, um, uh, does, does Ivan Tone live, in, live there? Does, does Ivan Tone? I said, no, mate, it's just me. <laughs> so, no, no, he doesn't live there. Um, you know, um, I'm sorry, somebody, my, my son said that Ivan Tony lived there and that kind of stuff. You know, I said, well, no, I said, just me and my family, mate, and that kind of stuff. You know, and you know, listen, it, it's, it's almost a backhanded compliment um, because, um, you know, I've, the, the rumours around Stamper is that I'm Ivan Tony. Yeah, I'm Ivan Tony and I live in this house. Now, <laughs> it's a backhanded compliment for me because like, I'm, I'm nearly 54 years old, yeah, and I'm being mistaken for a lad that's 20 in his mid-20s. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is strange, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of a backhanded compliment because it means that maybe I dress quite cool and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I look, look relatively fit and that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But, the fact, the fact that, you know, like you say, you can't have made any money unless you've been in sport, um, you know, is a little bit of an insult at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? It's a little bit of an insult. So when you um, came out of the RAF and you went into the corporate world, obviously you didn't just set straight up on your own. You went no, out no, no, with other no, people. No, I, I, worked for, I worked for Bauer um, and I, I got into sales. Um, and, you know, I did very well in sales. Um, you know, I was sort of a natural done very well at it and I was in a sort of a pool of telesales people um, working on different magazines and, and back then the rite of passage there was a, a, a common path that people would come into the telesales bank and within a year they'd be promoted up to actually work on a specific magazine in a field sales role or an assistant ad manager role um, so you know I worked hard for, for a year and thought you know I, I'm going to follow that you know my colleagues and you know get blah 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 and um i i applied internally for more than half a dozen jobs yeah and didn't get any of them yeah um and i thought that's strange because then people were coming in below me and then getting jobs you know getting promoted up yeah, behind, you know, tele -sales and, and field sales is out on the road yeah. seeing clients usually exactly. come from company car and it's more senior job Ex exactly exactly and i thought this is strange um so I'd spoken to a guy that I that sort of was quite friendly with, a bit more senior. I said, what's going on here, John? I said, I'm not getting the sniffs and that kind of stuff. Because I'll be honest with you, Cole, one of the jobs you went for on the motorcycling magazine, the ad manager was a bit concerned that sending a black guy out on the road wouldn't sort of pay a lot of dividends. Do you know what I mean? He, you know, he, he wouldn't, you know, he was concerned that you wouldn't get the sales because you're a black guy. Black guys on motorbikes wasn't really, you know, a common theme and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and, and that disappointed me um, and that kind of stuff. And I think um, it was then that I decided I was going to leave then. I thought I'm going to leave. Um, but do you know what, Robert? I said to myself then, do you know what? I'm not going to be a victim at the end of the day. I'm not going to be a victim, yeah, of the colour of my skin. Yeah. So I don't feel inferior to anyone. Yeah. I don't feel inferior to anybody who's white, anybody who's black, anybody who's Asian. You know. I don't feel inferior and I'm not going to be a victim. And because that guy said, I think that he'd have a problem selling out on the road in the motorcycle sector, yeah, because of the colour of his skin, I thought, well, I'll show you at the end of the day. So, yeah. you know, I thought then I'm not going to be a victim. Um, you know, I ended up, I ended up working in the, in the truck industry um, and subsequently in the farming sector. And you know, these are sectors that are not dominated with black people. 
I was going to say, it's all well in motorbikes, but at the same time, you probably didn't at the time have many black farmers and things like that either. Exactly. So for me, it was never, I was never overly conscious about being black. I used, I thought, I felt I used that to my advantage. Even now, I had people that I've only ever met once in the truck industry. Yeah. And when they used to ring me off and talk to the girls, used to ring them to sell them advertising. Is that black guy still there? Is that black guy still there? Because I've met them like, 20 years ago yeah so i thought to myself you know what this black skin of mine is going to make me almost famous in this sector do you know what yeah, I mean? yeah. that kind of stuff and you know i said once they meet me i'll never be forgotten at the end of the day and i i, I felt i just was going to use that to my advantage at the end of the day um and you know i i i, I just i just cracked on and then i just cracked on um you know i'm you know i'm good at building relationships um you know, I'm good at being customer facing and, you know, I use that skill to my advantage. Now, you're not saying that I didn't come across anybody who wasn't um, slightly racist and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I thought, you know, I, I could sort of, I could change someone's mind. I thought, I thought, you know what, I'm going to show them that, you know, black isn't bad. Don't yeah. Really. yeah. Um, and you know, you're going to meet me and it's going to change your mind at the end of the day. And I, I you know, I dealt with and, and became friends with a lot of people that didn't have, you know, didn't have a lot of connection with black people and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I just sort of threw that off my back to say, right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to open your eyes. I'm going to enlighten you to the fact that, you know, what the stereotype you've seen of black people you know, that you may have seen, you know, and you've formed an opinion, I'm going to change that opinion. And then I'm going to change that opinion um, and being who I am at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, whether, I don't know whether it worked. I think it might have worked. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, feel that people never advertised with us because I was black and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I had loads of jaw-dropping moments where I'd spoken to people on the phone and I turned up and they were like almost mouth open sort of thing yeah. oh you're black oh, my God. oh you're black <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah. Well, sort of thing. but then i had that on many occasions when i was interviewing staff and interviewing people for work and stuff so they'd come into the office uh, they'd arrange an interview and i'd walk in and they'd look at me and i'd look at them and i'll go hi how you doing i'm colin Med I'm, I'm colin medwinter and they were almost like wow well you're the boss and well i am actually yeah you don't mean i am actually so you know it, my life's been full of that it's full of those jaw-dropping moments at the end of the day where people... So when you left, you, you were working for that company, you left, and then obviously you set up on your own. And, uh, and that must have been, for any of us that have done that, black, white, whatever, that's quite an inspiring kind of moment. You go, right, I believe in myself enough to go and do this. Yes. And I think when we start, we've all got these visions of what we want it to be and what we can achieve. Yeah. And then as that starts to become a reality, it's like, wow. And then you ride the crest of this wave for a long time. And with you, you took your game that you'd worked on from in a couple of others, you took it, you set up on your own, and actually you, you rode the crest of that wave and created many waves. You, you did extremely well out of that business. Yeah, yeah, we, we did fantastic, to be fair. And, you know, it was down to not just me, it was the people that I had. I, I had a good group of people around me. Um, you know, you, you need a, a good group of people to build a business. Um, I, I felt I had the right team behind me to build that business and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I was driving the business, um, you know, direction of the business and that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, yeah, we got where we were going. Um, you know, you it, think it, you ever, it, as well as customers, do you think you ever had any... I think at times we all get a little bit of resentment from staff because we're a bit flexible. They don't see the behind the scenes stuff that we do, but not that basis. Do you think you ever got some underlying resentment that some people worked for a black guy or had you selected them enough not to let that affect? Yeah, I don't think that happened in my organisation. Um, and do you know what? I... I my blackness, you know, it didn't, I didn't, I wasn't hung up on being black. And so, you know, we, we, we'd had banter about blackness in the office 
and that kind of stuff. Um, and I suppose, you know, if somebody had a racist joke to tell and that kind of stuff, yeah, tell it. I don't, I'll listen to it as well. I'll have a laugh as well at the end of the day. You know, I don't believe that because you tell a joke about an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman, that you're racist at the end of the day. It might be an Englishman, an Irishman and a Jamaican. It's yeah. a joke. And you've got to take it in that context that it's a joke at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, we would have a lot of banter in the office and that kind of stuff, um, you know, but it was never taken in the wrong way at the end of the day. It was never, never taken the wrong way. Um, you know, Zena, Zena, for instance, who worked with me for years, you know, she'd say, you know, you know, my parents were a bit racist. Do you know what I mean? They were a little bit racist, my parents were, and that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, we'd laugh about it, do you know what I mean? And I met um, Zena's mum, Mavis, um, and I had her eating out of my hand at the end of the day, do you know what I mean? She lived in Whittlesea, she was they sort of didn't mix with black people and all that kind of stuff. I was probably yeah. one of the only black people that, black people that met her. Um, but, you know, uh, listen, you know, she, she was like putty in my hands at the end of the day, you know, and so. What about, and what about then when you got together with Tracy? Now, obviously, there's the element that some people have said there's there's families that can have an issue, there's their friends, or there was still certainly years ago, there were certainly elements of black and white people don't date. Yes. Did you yes. ever come across any of this? No, I've got to, to be fair, um, within Tracy's sort of immediate family, her mum and dad and stuff, um, you know, they they welcome me with open arms yeah. and that kind of stuff. They, they hadn't got a racist bone in their body at the end of the day. Um, they're lovely people. Um, yeah, got on with them straight away. Um, was, you know, uh, just brought into the family. Great. Um, there were other parts of the family that I felt were a little bit sort of, you know, standoffish um, yeah. and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, so, but they weren't openly sort of racist about it or anything like that. But, you know, I, I could tell that they sort of thought, oh, Trace is going to have a black guy. Oh, Trace is going to have a black guy and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it didn't, it didn't bother me. Um, you know, I, I know that some of them thought it, but I've got to say in the, in the, in the whole family, you know, probably 85% were absolutely spot on. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely spot on. No problems at all. Um, you know, uh, I was a very sort of, um, friendly sort of charming sort of guy and that kind of stuff um well, you know you're you're a very you're a ve always have been a very approachable easy guy to speak to and deal with in conversation so if somebody there'd be absolutely no reason you wouldn't get along with people you know as long as as long as someone's not there with an issue with the color of your skin because you yeah. know you are and it, you know i'm not saying that you know it, you, you're an extremely likable guy that yourself no matter how successful you become non-judgmental you don't look down your nose at other people so no. yes that, that doesn't surprise me at all that people no. are very accepting no but it, it, i think that in a in a relationship like mine with tracy um you know you, you are a little bit guarded um because you know when you have children they're going to be mixed race and that kind of stuff and you know i, I wanted my children to understand um, from a young age, that they 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 had that they had black in them at the end of the day. So you know, I wanted them to know that if they were walking down the street and somebody shouted across the street the M word, the chances are they're talking to you at the end of the day. So what I don't want you to do is not be aware that you are partly black at the end of the yeah. day. You're mixed race. You're partly white. You're partly black. But know that you are partly black, and that people will come at you for that reason. Yeah, so I don't want them to be unaware of that and to be walking down the street and somebody said the N word and say, well, who, who are they talking to? And that yeah. kind of stuff. And, and, and how awful they, they should even need that warning, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you an incident that happened to, to my oldest son um, at school, and then Cliff Walker was involved in this as well in the end. But he was in a, a, an English lesson at school um, at Sawtree, and they were doing, uh, they were reading the Of Mice of Men book. Yeah, um, I don't know if you've read that. Yeah. And they had to write a piece, a, a news article on, on the the the, um, the 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 subject matter. Um, and so they'd gone through it in the classroom. And at the end of the class, they were packing up their desks and stuff. And they had been set the homework to write the news article. And the teacher um, sort of <laughs> took it upon himself to sort of, oh, oh hang on, class. Um, just so that you know, um, 
if any of you want to use the N word in your article, it's fine. Yeah. So my son came home and he used the word, he used the full word in the classroom. Yeah. My son came home and he said, Dad, I'm fuming. Do you know what I mean? That, that, this is what happened and I don't think it's right. Yeah, I said, fantastic son, you've done the right thing. So there's one, one of the mixed race girls in the class. Um, I contacted her mum and said, do you know what happened in the class today? No. Um, oh, okay. So she didn't, hadn't spoken to you about it. No, no. So, you know, I then thought to myself, well, that young lady doesn't, is not aware of her ethnic background. Yeah, my son was, I was fuming. Yeah. Um, I spoke to Cliff Walker because I knew that he was sort of, he can, he can articulate himself very well. Um, and I asked his opinion on the situation. Um, and, you know, we, we actually, you know, took it further down the line. Um, mm. And that teacher got severely, got, he got disciplined for it in the end. Um, and, you know, we could have taken it further. And <clears throat> I think maybe he may have lost his job over it, to be fair. But I didn't want to, my son's education was important. I didn't want to be sort of, I didn't want that to distract, detract from his education. At the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I took it to a certain point and I sort of accepted the fact that he was going to be disciplined and there was going to be further training um, and stuff. But I, I, you know, that to me was unacceptable at any level. I could have gone to the newspapers, I could, I could have been on every newspaper in the country, yeah. any word used in the classroom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and, you know, fortunately the kids in his class, they knew it was wrong because after the lesson they said, are you all right, Louis? are you okay? Yeah, are you okay? Because they knew it was something that could be contentious, which was nice to, to see um, yeah. and that kind of stuff. But then again, it could then open the door then for, um, you know, other kids to start sort of, you know, verbally attacking him in that way and all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you make it kids. acceptable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, which... And then for, for a teacher um, to think that that is acceptable, I was absolutely flabbergasted. And yeah. that kind of stuff. So, you know, you know, so being with Tracy was one thing, but, you know, looking after my children was com something completely different at the end of the day. Um, you know, Tracy's been ver verbally um, racially abused, like in Peterborough, city centre. I think the boys were probably about six and seven or seven and eight at the time. Um, some guy walked past her and, you know, he said, you know, keep the, keep the ends off the street. And that kind of stuff. But he didn't stop and say, talk to her. He just walked past and said, keep the shout, keep the ends off the street because they were messing about outside Marks and Spencer's. Um, you know, listen, I eventually tracked this guy down and, you know, uh, sort of sorted that situation out. Just, let's just say that. There's a lot of people, a lot of the time, it was if, uh, if a white, white girl was then a black guy, they'd be called um, an end lover. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. And that was kind of a But when you talk about the children, it's interesting as well that, that, that Tracy sort of re received racism on their behalf, if you like, for, yeah. for them. But when you talk about the kids, obviously you've got four boys. Talking to Chaz the other day uh, on the phone, and he kind of um, just said about his lads. Would you say that your boys refer to themselves and see themselves as black or white or completely mixed race? That's a really good question. That is a really good question. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't know really. Um, I think, mm, I think they would class themselves as more black than they were white. Um, but embrace the fact they're a mixed race, right? If if, if that's an, an answer, um, but without asking them how they feel about it at the end of the day, because um, it's it's difficult to to you can't you you are mixed race, you are fifty fifty at yep. the end of the day. Um, so I think in their in their um, the way they carry themselves, that they're probably a little bit more black. Um, at yeah. the end of the day, really, um, but not totally on that sort of yeah. that, that kind of thing. So their friend groups are very mixed. For yeah, yeah, absolutely. They don't, have, yeah. they don't have lots of black friends. You know, just black friends. They don't have just you know just white friends. They've got a mixture of black, 
mixed race and and white friends. Um, and having so. seen the older lads play football at different times at tournaments we were at, um, yeah. and then of course getting to know Theo over the last sort of four or five years that Lewis and Theo have been in the same class at school. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm going to do a session with Theo tomorrow night. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a question I'll ask Theo. Yes, that'd be a good uh, question. Yeah. And do, do you think as well, yourself and Chaz have both got mixed race children. So Chaz was quite, he, he thought, yeah, my, my children identify as black. Do you think it matters to the child if mum or dad are black or white? So would boys following their father's footsteps, so you being the black person within the relationship, boys sway towards their dad? Do you think that yes. can be influential? So I think that could be influential. Do you think that's the way they kind of, they could sway towards their dad's side? Yeah, I think so. And I think, like you said, boys do tend to sway towards their dad, to be fair. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't have the benefit of having a daughter, do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, otherwise I'd be able to sort of see the instant difference in how my daughter was and then yeah. they uh, might sway towards her mum. Uh, Megan, you know, probably does sway more towards her mum. Um, uh, at the end of the day, um, they have a very close relationship. Um, whereas the boys with the banter with dad and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, the football and that kind of stuff, it's all been sort of that side. So, you know, yeah. we'd go to, we'd go to football tournaments all day. I'd play reggae in the car and that, and then R and B and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, they'd be like, oh yeah, good. I'd play that track again, dad. I like that track, blah, blah, blah. So by default, they became more sort of on my side. Yeah. Like, they yeah. spent a lot of time they spent a lot more time with me um, yeah. and like, because of and also they look up to their dad and, 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 and kids mimic their parent and things like that so of course they're, they're kind of copy and, and they have the same thought process and then yes. tastes and things like that often certainly yeah. if you know I'm not blowing smoke up your ass we'd have enough banter but as a dad that wasn't an old fashioned dad for example as well you'd have had music taste that they could also relate to. So when I was yes. younger, my dad was well into Elvis, for example. As so, it happened, I do like Elvis, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan. But I think if I was a teenager now, I wouldn't want that blasting going to a football tournament. So, no. <laughs> so I think if the, if the lads related to that and they get on that level, um, so I think that was, you know, that can also help. Yeah, um, yeah no, definitely, yeah, definitely. So, okay. I mean, obviously, a lot of the individual questions that I've kind of asked people, we've kind of, we've kind of covered. Um, yes. But to wrap up and a few, just a few remaining questions. Do you think then over the last 20, 30 years, racism's got better, worse, or the same, but in a different way these days? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's definitely got better. Um, you know, having having the knowledge of what my parents endured when they came to this country. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of it does stem back to then because, um, you know, my, my parents, you know, are sort of West Indian. Um, and obviously Jamaica was a, a, a British colony at the end of yeah. the day. So well, they were Jamaican, were they, your parents? Yeah, well, my dad's actually Cuban, but um, because of the Fidel Castro regime, um, his family fled Cuba when he was about 10 years old. Right. Um, he had to have another passport somehow, a uh, Jamaican passport. He got hold of somehow, I don't know. But, um, so, yeah, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he's Jamaican. Sort of Jamaican. Um, but, um, you know, they looked to the UK as the mothership. And then, yeah. you, know, you know, that was, you know, we are a British colony. And then when, when the UK sent out the call for, for, for help, to say, you know, after the war, we need to rebuild the country, um, or even before the war, um, that you know they, they called for help. Um, a lot of you know minority countries um, at the time sent troops um, into battle on behalf of the UK and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then when we came to the to the UK to rebuild the country, um, and we were openly invited. And parents of my generation got here. People of my parents' generation got here, um, and there wasn't the warm welcome that they expected. So I mean, it was like. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we've got no houses for you to rent here. Um, you know, no, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And that kind of stuff was the, the, the common one that sort of springs to mind. Um, and, you know, they were given 
more menial jobs to do. So there might have been trained nurses and stuff, but they were working in factories and stuff um, because yeah. all your qualifications aren't good over here and that kind of stuff. So they weren't really welcomed with open arms, to be fair. Um, and that was difficult <laughs> for them back, back in the day. Um, back in the day, so you know they've had to sort of fight a lot of more races than I've had to fight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and would you so say think, you've had more racism to fight than Theo? Yes, definitely. So definitely. we're making progress. There is progress, but there's yeah, so much more to yeah. do. And, yeah. and in an interview yeah. I did earlier in the week with, 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 with Claudio, one of the things that we were discussing, nowadays, when, you, for example, you walk through that hangar, if now we're walking through Hampton and a guy's sat on a bench and he shouts the N-word, first of all, most people would be shocked and tell him, or certainly some people would tell him or say something. Second, because those vocal and violent type of racist, if you like, are less and less and few and far between now, they're easier to deal with because, as I'm sure you've experienced in the past, you can grab him, you can drag him out in the car park, you can report him to the police, you can do whatever. Going back to the point you were making earlier, you can't actually tell and control exactly what someone's thinking. So because someone's not shouting it on a bench or shouting it as you walk past the other side of the street, that doesn't mean to say kids of today are going to walk into an interview and someone thinks, oh, I didn't realise that. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think there's an element of that still there. So just because we've made progress, yeah. there's still a lot to do. Yeah, it may, it may, like you say, it may look like we've made progress, but may, maybe it's just because it's gone more underground, like you say, don't mean that it's a little bit more sort of, you know, overt and you can't tell, you know, what people are thinking and what, you know, what the actions they're taking because of their thoughts and that kind of stuff, you know, maybe in an interview situation or a job promotion situation. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love you to talk to a friend of mine, um, uh, Karen Vanterpool, um, she um, was um, in, in the police force um, and she'd done fantastic. And I mean, she'd done really fantastic. She ended up as the assistant chief constable of Cambridgeshire. Um, oh. And she was only here yesterday, funnily enough, and um, they popped in for social distancing alone and that kind of stuff. But, you know, she's done amazing, but she, she would tell you herself that the amount of racism that she encountered within the police force and that kind of stuff, do you know what I mean? You know, just in her career at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? Do you um, think she's doing an interview? Do you think she's doing I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to her, yeah, I'll, I'll certainly speak to her. Um, you know, she's very, she's very open about it, she, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, the fact that she, you know, she had been held back and sort of looked at, overlooked for promotions and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I'll give her a call this week and I'll, I'll mention what you're doing. But, oops. So I'm yeah, just yeah. lost. I lost. I'm just going to plug my phone in because uh, he's trying <laughs> to threaten, threaten to run out of battery. Um, oopsie. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'll come me. This. So the thing for me, and I suppose that that you again, I get on with most of the uh, most of the kids' friends. They're, they're, there's no issue. I'm very approachable. My niece asked me the other day after I did the first video. I posted it, and she says, "Rob." I love that. I'm learning. I'm doing this. She said, what, what can I do? So I suppose twofold. What as a guy who's just come into his 40s and has done quite well, so some would see as kind of privileged. I certainly wasn't. It's all come from nothing. But what can I do to change these perceptions and help more? What, what can you do? What can I do? And then what can she do, for example, as a, as a girl who's coming into her 20s, what can she do? So the two different generations, what can we do? Well, do you know what? I think what you're doing now is fantastic. Um, I think um, just being able to talk to people about it. So talking to you know, the black community, do you know what I mean? Just to sort of... Um, get their thoughts and experiences and that kind of stuff. So a lot of people, a lot of black people, when they, when they um, have experienced racism, they don't talk about it because they think, well, well I don't, I'm not going to talk about it because nobody really, nobody's interested um, and that kind of stuff. If I moan too much, I just say, oh, you're playing the race card all the time and that kind of stuff. 
<laughs> and, and do you know what? I use that as an example in, in, in another interview when people say um, that the race car, and then of course, luck of virus, we all evolve. So then what yeah. the racists did was then turn around and just any time there was racism, throw it's the race card, it's the race card. Yeah. So they kind yeah. of flipped it. And yeah, so, uh, you know, talking to people and things like that, sharing the post yeah. and all that. Yeah, I, I think so. I think, I think that, you know, creating awareness is, is fantastic. And, you know, it means more coming from you. Do you know what I mean? If I had done this, it could still mean a lot. But when it's come from, you know, uh, you know uh, somebody of, of white origin and then yeah. they, who's, who's had enough, and then yeah. they wants to speak up. Um, you know, I think it means a lot more. You know, I think, you know, that means a whole lot more. Uh, you know, I had a white friend of mine I've known for, for years. Um, she's godfather, she, she, they're godparents to my oldest son. I'm godparents to their oldest son. And she, she messaged me after this George, um, George, um, George Floyd thing and said, um, you know, I'm so sorry for the racing and, and stuff that you've experienced in, that, in your life and that kind of stuff. And I said, I, I messaged, well, you don't need to apologize to me. I said, you're not the one that needs to apologize to me. And then the day, don't mean, you know, you, it's not, you know, you don't need to apologize. But she felt the need to message me and say, I'm so sorry for all of the bad experiences you've experience. had. And that kind well, of it's stuff. funny you should say, because one of the um, things, and one of the messages that I really want to get across is we can't for, years to come continue to apologize with any meaning let's be honest with any meaning we can't continue to apologize for the slave trade and racism 20 30 40 50 years ago what we can do i believe because apologies have meant nothing up until this point mm. what we can do to show that is one educate ourselves by speaking to the black community and revising what has happened so understand the feeling. The biggest thing I think we can do to apologize though, for what our ancestors, if you like, did to your ancestors, is to now stand up side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and fight the change, the final or the existing push of racism. Yeah. That yeah. is more than words. It's easy yeah. to say sorry, but it's not changed. We need yeah. to do it. Exactly, and that's and, and that's what you're doing. You know what I mean? You're doing something about it. You know I mean? You're taking some emotive action. You know what I mean? You're saying, right, enough's enough. I'm not going to just say I feel sorry for George Floyd. I feel sorry for his family. Blah blah blah. I want to do something. I want to. I want to do something that's going to make a change at the end of the day. And you've done exactly that. And you've you know rolled your sleeves up and you thought I'm going to do something. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to talk to black people like me, like Cliff Walker, um, like your, your daughter's friend, Cla Cla Claudio, Claudia, yeah. Claudia. I'm going to talk to these people and I'm going to, you know, I want to open up to those people. I want to, I want to hear their experiences. I want to yeah. share, I want to feel the pain and the, the humiliation that they feel felt in certain circumstances. And I want that to be shared to a wider audience. Yeah. Because by doing that, people go, actually, I oh, I didn't know that went on. Do you know, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that went on. Do you know, I didn't know that happened to people. And you know, yeah, people, and I didn't think, know it's still there. Yeah. Well, it exactly. is. Yeah. Do you, know I mean? you know, it is still there. And you know, I'll tell you one a quick story before we, we finish off that kind of stuff. That you know, I, in in 2010, I think it was, and I was amazed at the time because I thought this is 2010. Do you know what I mean this shouldn't even be happening? You know, um, you know, I, I took it upon myself to. Um, I was helping to care for um, a disabled boy who's mixed race. Um, and we, I used to go to the posh games with him on a Saturday. And this one Saturday, we were a little bit late getting there because we used to get in the hospitality box and a friend of mine had. Um, so we get there early and, you know, sort of had the buffet and all that kind of stuff. But we were a little bit late this, this Saturday. Parked up at my office, you know, my office is. Yeah. Um, got out onto Bridge Street and we were walking just over the bridge and then we were playing Nottingham Forest that day. And there was a, a group of about 15 Forest fans on the other side of the road going to the game. Um, and, and Josh, he's got Down syndrome. Um, and, you know, he stares a lot. He stares at people a lot. And that kind yeah. of stuff. So we're walking on the other side of the road. And all of a sudden, I, I hear this tirade of abuse from the other side of the street. You effing black this, you N-word this, you fucking we'll fucking kill you, blah, blah, blah. And all that kind of stuff. 
I was like looking things shit. Do you know what I mean? And there, there weren't a single policeman about. Yeah, because we were a little bit late getting to the game, so maybe so they were in the game. Like, yeah, maybe gone into the game by then. And I thought I'm in charge of somebody's 15 year old disabled child, and I've got 15 grown men who had been charged up on drink and drugs and all that kind of stuff, who have now taken upon themselves to target us at the end of the day. You know, I, you know, I thought, what, what am I going to do? Do you know what I mean? I thought, I've, you know, so I've, I've said to Josh, just keep walking, just keep walking, Josh, just don't look over there, keep walking. And it carried on over the bridge. And any time they could have come across that road and attacked us at the end of the day, you know, by, the, by God's will, it didn't happen at the end of the day. I was furious, John. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. was absolutely yeah. fuming. I wanted to go across there and rip someone's head off. Yeah. I would have taken a good shoe in, but you know what? I'd have took some people down with me. But yeah. I, had somebody's ch- I had somebody's child with me, yeah, and I had to bite my lip, yeah, and I had to carry on walking and suffer the humiliation, yeah. I'm, you know, bear in mind, I'm 40, I'm 40 odd years old at this stage, do you know what I mean? And, you know, I've worked hard. I've, built a business, I've got some standing in the community and I'm putting up with that kind of racist abuse, yeah, on a Saturday afternoon, I thought to myself, this is 2010, how is this even happening? Yeah. How is this happening? Disgusting. You know, I get in, we're in that game then and both teams have got black players playing from as well, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, how are you going to watch a team that, yeah, but you know, you see the braces in football and that kind of stuff at the top level and that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. see it, you know, it's, it's, not, it's well documented. You and know, if people don't see it, and stuff. if and people don't see it, they choose not to see it because it's most definitely there. It's yeah, most absolutely. definitely there. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it just, it saddens me, don't we? It just, it really does sadden me. The, 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 yeah. And that was a, an incident that really sort of hit me to the core a little bit, do you know what I mean? Because yeah, I, yeah, and I, mean, couldn't do, I couldn't do anything about it either, do you know what I mean? I was just... You know, and that's that, that set you back, sort of not set you back, but, you know, that's 20 years prior to that happening, yeah. that kind of stuff happened. So for it to happen whilst you're with a child as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it yeah. is just disgusting. And they're the kind of things that more and more people, and as I was saying, it's not just okay now to not be racist. Because you yeah. shouldn't be. <laughs> You've act- We've got to stand. It's time for people to stop minding their own business. Mm. Yeah, that's that's my view on it, most definitely. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, but you know, like like people have said just recently on a lot of the social media and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you, you're not born a racist. Do you know what I mean? You, you're taught that at the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? You're sort of you learn that over the years. Do you know what I mean? You don't come out of the womb as a two-year-old child and you're a racist at the end of the day, don't we? Nah. You know, that, that is taught or influenced in your later years in life. Um, yeah. That kind of stuff, do you know what I mean? That's, you know, other people's influences um, that have influenced you at the end of the day to say, oh, I'm a racist. And, that and do you think that's why it's changing? Because, for example, when I was at school, I think I was sort of 12, and, and um, a lad joined our school in what is year eight. So in my year, I had one black lad. I had um, uh, a couple of Indian lads, but I had one black lad who joined in year eight. So what me and Anne-Marie were discussing the other night as well is I had very few at that time. So going back, I left school in the mid-90s. So let's say in the early 90s, the mid-90s, I had very few mixed-race friends. Mm. So one black lad joined, there were very few mixed race kids, you know, and I was trying to rack my brains thinking, hang on, there were, and I could think, I could think of one or two. Do you think that learned behavior that you're talking about, because now our generations are coming through that didn't necessarily see that or agree with that, we're now not teaching our kids to be that, we're actually teaching them the opposite. So do you think it's fading out almost? Do you think I, I that's think, happening? Yeah. I think I think as the generations go on, and I think like like Theo um, Theo's age group, um, and you know they they they're all mixed together. They all they all go to school together. Yeah. They're all in a friend group together, and that kind of stuff. And they don't see the colour as much. I think they're aware of the fact that you know they're a mixed race. Um, some of the boys are black. Some are mixed race. Some are Asian, and so on and so forth. But I just don't think it's a big issue for them. Um, and I think they they are more united with you know the situation about the black lives matter and all that kind of stuff i yeah, think they're more definitely. bothered 
I think yeah. they're definitely more bothered. Um, and I think they want to stand shoulder to shoulder with, you know, their, their sort of school friends, the children that they've grown up with over, over the years at school and that kind of stuff. And they're pre more prepared to take a stand because they yeah. think it's disgusting as well um, yeah. and stuff. So, you know, I think it definitely is getting better. Um, but, you know, it goes both ways at the end of the day. Um, you know, I remember thinking when I was at school that um, the segregation of sections of the Pakistani and the Asian community were sort of almost racist itself, don't you know what I mean? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. they were saying that you can go to school with the English people and the black people, but you're not marrying one of those. You're marrying one of your own kind and that kind of stuff. So, you know, a girl would be taken off to Pakistan to marry into, you know, a Pakistani family that they've been prearranged married and all that kind of stuff. And she wouldn't want to do it and that yeah. kind of stuff because oh, well, I went to school with, you know, my, I, I love this guy. Yeah, I, I, I want to be with that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Don't mean stuff. And, but they were, the, the, the Asian Pakistani families were very, very, um, vocal about the fact that their children shouldn't mix they shouldn't intermarry and that kind of stuff they wanted their children to be sort of you're not marrying a white person you're marrying a black person yeah that kind of stuff you've got to you know but the thing is i think if you come to this country to live um then you've got to integrate yeah in this country. and if that means your daughter fell in love with a white guy or a you know, kind of, if you want to be that. totally accepted you've well, got to be totally accepting yeah you can't just take some parts of it and say well yeah, we'll have the education and you can go to school with them, but you can't marry one of those. You can't yeah. go out with one of those, and that kind of stuff. And that, when I was at school, that was the done thing, do you know what I mean? It was, you know, they were very much segregated, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of stuff where, you know, they, they, and they'd have to marry, you know, in my, in my, you know, my parents didn't tell me who to go out with. I no. went out with anybody I wanted to go out with. I wanted to go out yeah. with a black girl, I went with a black girl. I wanted to go out with a white girl, I went with a white girl. Um, yeah. That was my prerogative at the end of the day and they were happy for me to be happy doing what I wanted to do but those those part you know certain factions of the Asian and Pakistani community were no nah, that, that's not that's not happening and then, yeah no. and, it, and one of the topics that are with this now and, and, and continuing it and not taking uh, you know I don't want it to be something for me or for anybody else that is a topic at the moment because of George Floyd which of course was disgusting but the reason there's an outcry is not because George Floyd was killed. It's because it was caught on camera. Because had people, there, there was plenty of other people. So because it was caught on camera, we could see it, we could relate to it. Well, we've sure. heard stories. So what I want to do is continue this, continue it on. And one of the conversations that I'd like to have in the future with people is if we take white people out of the equation, and we're talking about the BAME community, which, let's face it, one of the points I made is because some people are um, politically correct, shall we say, got to be politically correct. What they've done is they've gone, OK, we'll be politically correct, but what we'll do is we'll put all these people into a community so we can say nice words, but do you not realise that you're still segregating the whole section mm. from white? You're still doing yeah. that, even though you're trying to be correct. But what would be interesting is conversations that if you took white people out of the equation, what racism is within the BAME mm. community amongst each other? Because yeah. if yeah. there is, and that is there, well, okay, we've got to eliminate that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, it's not just white people that are racist. Do you know what I mean? You know, yeah. I've, been, I've been called the N-word in, in Cyprus. You know, I've got, I had a holiday home in Cyprus for years. I've been called the N-word out there. Do you by Turkish Cypriots at the end of the day, do you know stuff? So, you know, it's not just a white problem at the end of the day. It's, uh, you know, it's an everybody yeah, problem. Absolutely. And I, and I think if you look at proportions and uh, population, yes, the majority is going to be white, certainly if you're talking about here and in the USA, yes, because the exactly. majority of the population. So we've got to start yeah. with the big numbers and then look at it all. But I think it will be interesting. And again, talking to yourself and getting a different take that, I know our kids most definitely, you know, the generation is more accepting and rightly so and everything else. Yeah, sure. But to hear your side and, uh, and going back even further earlier when I spoke to Cliff, to hear what happened and what you did experience to get through. Because one of the things that, you know, I pointed out to Claudio as well when I spoke to him the other day was um, 
some people's perception used to be, say, when I was younger, oh, black lads are tough. It so happened that the kid who joined my school was a tough kid. So yeah. if you only know one or two black lads, actually, you think, oh, they're, and they're hard, you thought, oh, they're all hard. Well, when I actually thought about that the other day and thought it's ridiculous because the colour of your skin doesn't mean you're tough or not. But if you actually think about it, I don't know many black guys and girls that shy away from an issue or a confrontation in the same way as a lot of people, what a lot of people white do. And I wonder if that's because from a young age, there's a built-in fight and desire because yeah. you have to have more fight than a privileged white kid. Yeah, yeah. You think that, yeah. that, that could be? Yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, I think you're spot on. You've got you to have some gumption, you know, and you've got to be able to front up a situation. Um, yeah. You know, because, you know, you, it's sort of built, built in. Day, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, you know, not not everybody's like that. Not every black person's like that. But a lot of black people are. Um, you know, I remember when I was at school. You know, black women, black women were very feisty. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They'd, they'd front you up. Do you know what I mean? They'd, I'll fight you. Yeah. Oh, shit, no, no, <laughs> no, don't put me down, please. Don't, don't knock me <laughs> down from my face. <laughs> yeah, they, they would they would get their fist ready to have a fist fight with you. And that yeah. kind of stuff, do you know what I mean? But it's just you know, I think it's just that it's a, it's a I don't know, it's a, it's a black thing, it's like, you know, we're, we're ready to take on a situation, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, I, and I, I do think that's because from a young age, you're either taught by parents or just something ingrained as you see certain situations. Okay, I've got to fight a little bit more than this kid just to get the same. Yeah. I've got to be a bit louder. I've got to be a bit tougher. So I've got to be louder to be heard the same as this kid. Yeah. And, and, and then obviously the fight comes from, well, actually some people were still, you know, fight is a natural fight or flight. So you're going yeah. in on it. So I, I, I do think that. So when I was thinking about it, I thought a lot of the people that I know that are, that are black and mixed race, things like that, male or female. Yeah, actually confrontation. And if you're talking yeah. percentage of the people, yeah, I'd say that the black community have got that fight yeah. in a bit more, as you say, gumption, because it's, it's got to be ingrained from a young age yeah. that had to, and, I, and I, I, I think that's the be. so. Yeah, no, I, I think it's making me fair. Um, you know, what, what I would say, um, just about the whole subject matter is, you know, listen, I want black people to have opportunity equal to white people and that kind of stuff, but I'm a great believer in the best man getting the job, do you know what I mean? What I don't want is, you know, a, a rite of passage for my mixed race children because they're mixed race, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to give that guy a job because he's black and I want to be seen as, you know, non-racist and that kind of stuff. Which is I racist. Want me, I want you to give me the job because <laughs> yeah. I'm the best man for the job. At the end of the day. Yeah. You know I mean? I've demonstrated that I'm the best person for the job. And at times, you know, a member of the black community will go up against, you know, four or five white people and they won't get the job. And it's no. not always because they're not. It's not always because they're black. Don't yeah, me. they've got a twenty percent chance. Take away the colour of the skin, they've got a twenty percent chance of exactly. getting a job. So, exactly. uh, if, if you then look at five hundred interviews, and only five people have got jobs that are black, there's a problem with the percentage. If twenty mm. percent of them have got it, you go actually, there's nothing either way because that was the percentage of people that went for it that were likely to get it. So, yes. but I agree. I, 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 I agree with that completely. I, I, I think that it's disrespectful to give someone a job based on the colour of their skin. Because I can't remember if it was the police force or the, the football management association. Someone, I think, were coming along the lines where a certain percentage had to be black yeah. and ethnic minority. Yeah, no, that's not right. It's not, it's, it's not that, right. That, I don't think that's right. Of course, I mean. what it does come back to as well, though, is you've got and had for years now, I mean, if you go back to Cyril Regis, who made real impacts with Anderson, these players, yep. you've had a lot of very gifted footballers, and more so, more so, more so, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'll tell you what, you know, the old argument of why aren't they going into football management, the only thing I can think of that, and as I stated in the video earlier in the week, I just wonder if that is because still the majority of people that are in a privileged enough position to own a football club or run a football club are of a certain generation. So they're yeah. the ones that employ, employ a football manager. Yes, of course. 
So I saw interviews, Sol Campbell had gone for lots of jobs. Well, one chairman came out and said, look, it wasn't because he was black, it's because it, it, it was arrogant when he came in, he did this, he did that. When you hear Sol yeah. Campbell, he said, well, hang on, I've been for 16 before that and I'm getting a bit pissed off with being told no. Yeah. The percentage of footballers, black footballers, that become black football managers, well, uh, cool. could we name could could we name three at the moment? No, Chris Powell is he still in management? I can't remember. Um, yeah, there was Chris Powell. Chris, um, Chris Hutton was manager for a long Chris time. Hutton. I think he's now. Um, and um, who was the guy at uh, West Brom? Oh, he took over. Did really well. Did we? They sacked him in the top four or something. Now he's still in. Um, yeah. Oh. Uh, no, his name got out of my head. Um, yeah. I know the guy you mean. But it's funny because you, well, not funny, but. You look at the Premiership, look at the Premier League, you look at the Championship. Well, hang on a minute. For years now, that's been a good percentage of those footballers have been black. Why is there not the percentage of those footballers being football managers? Uh, it's got to be an issue, Colin. It's yeah, yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Because you would think that, you know, like you say, when Viv Anderson was the first black player to play for England, um, you know, in the Cyril Regis era, there was, you know, you could sort of pick out the black players, you know, on one hand. Yeah. But now, at any premiership game, you know, you've got four or five black players, you know, yeah. on, on a team. And on, team. Stuff. on each team. And yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, those players, what are happening to those players in the last 20 years that come out of, you know, playing, um, you know, the ones of maybe Ian Wright's era and all that kind of stuff, who's, they followed on from Viv Anderson and that kind of stuff. You yeah. know, why, why are they not managers? You know, right. you know, but then equally, you know, you've got like in Europe, you know, you've got black players that played for France and that kind of stuff. You know, they haven't had any French. I don't know many black French managers really, no. um, managing French teams. And, you know, in Europe generally, do you know what I mean? You know, some of the black guys have played in Spain and all that kind of stuff. Well, you, you know, you, you can manage in Spain, do you know what I mean? But they ain't managing that there either. No. That's it. And that and that is that's the point. And I'm, that I think is the next generational change that we'll see. I, I do. Because, you know, you've had I, I think you likes of Rio Ferdinand. I think Rio Ferdinand make make a great manager because yeah. he was he was that way inclined, you know, and uh, and a lot of these guys and uh, you know, I'd want to see them coming through as management. And when I do, then I believe that it's getting better at that level. But at the moment I don't think it is. No, no, I, I think you're right. I think there is an issue at that level. Um, and, you know, when you've got black players saying that, you know, I want to be in management, but I'm not getting the opportunities and that kind of stuff, um, you know, then that's a problem. You know, they're having to manage in the, low, manage in the lower leagues and that kind of stuff. Do you know I mean, really? Why aren't they giving the opportunities to manage in the, in the top flight of football? They played top flight of football. And, and, and they're then, being told, OK, learn your trade, learn your trade. Well, hang on a minute. Mark Hughes gets fired because he gets a team relegated. He gets another Premier League job or a good championship job, time yeah. and time again. Well, I'll tell you what then, why are they having to go and prove themselves in the lower leagues or not even the, even the non-football league, non-league football? Why? Give them the opportunity. So I, I do think that's, that, that's an issue. And I, I think that hopefully, touch wood, is the next one we'll see to change over the next few years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Definitely interesting to see. Um, how that how that pans out for sure. So well, mate, it's been as I knew it would, very interesting. Very good, sir. Very good. Thank you for your time. And then what yeah. I'll do, mate, is I will uh, obviously I'm um, interviewing Theo tomorrow, and uh, I'll be in touch, mate, and we'll get together. Yes, yeah, so Theo's much more videogenic than I am, mate. Try absolutely. <laughs> he's, he's made for the camera. That guy, he's going to be famous. That guy. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I watched a video clip of him dancing earlier. One more or another, I'll tell you what. We're going to see more of him. I think you're right, mate. Definitely. Fantastic. Thanks, right, thanks mate. so much. Cheers, buddy. Take care, Take care. Cheers, mate. Yeah.